Hello, and welcome to my lab report. I am Robert Pig, and today we will be discussing a classic physics system, a pendulum. For this lab, I found a video of a pendulum online and analyzed it in Tracker. Then, I used Newton's second law to model the pendulum in question. By importing the data from Tracker into the model, we can compare the accuracy of my model quite easily. This lab is important because I had to learn to apply Newton's second law in a rotational context, greatly helping me learn the fundamentals of rotational motion and showing how Newton's second law can be applied to more systems than just those with translational motion. Initially, I had trouble modeling the motion due to the low frame rate of the camera, which made it difficult to match up my model and the observational data. However, after some experimentation, I have created a model that, given the circumstances, is very accurate. I also had trouble on the model because I had to start from scratch on the code and create a Frankenstein-like conglomeration of other labs to model the motion and present the data in a way I liked. The structure of the rest of this lab report is going to go as so. First, I will talk about using Tracker to get the observational data. Then, I will talk about programming the model using Newton's second. Next, I will compare the data using both X and Y position. And lastly, some final thoughts and conclusions. I had to search for a video of the pendulum online and then import it into Tracker. After finding a video, I went frame by frame, selecting the center of mass each time. After this, I copied the data into a CSV file so that I could graph the observed and predicted data at the same time. I chose the point of connection as the origin and used the frame in the video where the man holds a ruler next to the string to calibrate Tracker. However, there are some sources of error in the video. First off, the frame rate is quite low, leading to rough data, which we will see later when we compare the model to the observations. Secondly, another source of error is the string holding the mass up. In my model, we assume the string does not apply a spring force on the mass. However, real strings do not act as ideal strings do, so there is a spring force upon the ball. Finally, one last source of error from the video is the human error present in the selection of the position each frame. The first step for creating the model is setting up the initial conditions, such as the initial length and position of the mass, as well as preparing to graph the data so that we can see if the model works. The initial conditions allow for the visualization of the model as well as the computation. As you can see, the code creates the pendulum as well as the variables that describe the position, velocity, and corresponding time of the mass. Then I set up the graph for the position and copied in the data from the CSV file. The two pictures in the bottom right are inside the computational loop, which is examined on the next slide. The first one copies the position of the modeled mass per delta t onto the graph. The while loop copies over the observed data onto the graph. However, because the model runs much faster than the observational data from Tracker, I had to set it up to only plot the Tracker data after a number of intervals of the computational loop to match them up. Here is the computational loop that does the heavy lifting for the lab. In this case, we use the pendulum as the system and Earth as the surrounding. The first step is finding the angular acceleration. To do this, we can use the rotational form of Newton's second law, which says torque is equal to the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. I, or the rotational inertia, in this case, is mass times radius squared, and torque is negative radius times mass times gravity times sine theta. So after simplifying, angular acceleration is negative g divided by r times sine theta. In my code, instead of r for radius, I have l for length. Then, using the acceleration, we can update the angular velocity and angle of the pendulum, and then use the new angle to find the new position. By multiplying the acceleration by delta t and adding it to the initial velocity, we obtain a new velocity. We can then use this velocity, multiply it by delta t, and add it to the initial theta to obtain a new theta. Remember that theta is the angle of the pendulum. Using the new theta and a bit of trig with the length, we obtain the new position. Then, we need to update the position of the string but this is purely a cosmetic change to ensure the string stays connected so the model looks like a pendulum, but it does not affect the computation. Then, the code plots the new position of the ball, plots the position from the tracker data as detailed on the previous slide, and then updates the time using delta t. Here's the simulation of the pendulum and the tracker data presented together. As stated before, the low frame rate of the camera leads to the jumpiness of the red ball, which is the ball representing the observed data. As you can see, the two balls undergo nearly the same motion with approximately the same amplitude. Let's look at the motion more specifically by comparing the x and y values separately. Here are those graphs. The jumpiness of the data is present here as well, shown by the pointiness of the red curves, which depict the tracker data. My model is very accurate, especially for the x dimension. However, in the y dimension, it is a tad less accurate, possibly due to the sources of error identified earlier, such as the low frame rate and human error in tracker. One of those sources of error the string exhibiting a spring force may have a large impact on the y-graph. Because the pendulum never reaches a large angle, 
the spring force present in tracker data will impact the y dimension more than the x. Because this force is not accounted for in the model, it will lead to inaccuracies. Air resistance may also play a factor, but due to the low speed of the ball, it is not as important as other sources of air. I really enjoyed this lab, and it helped me better understand rotational motion and the associated formulas. Being able to pick the topic was also interesting, and having to program from scratch really tested my physics knowledge. I hope you enjoyed this report as much as I did. Thanks for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe.